Okay, so we are making our way through Unit 3 of Parables of Jesus. And Unit 3 is called Foundational Parables because we're covering parables from the book of Mark that most of them are also found in the book of Matthew and the book of Luke. And the fact that they're in all three synoptic gospels has to indicate to us that they are significant or foundational to the teachings of Jesus. Well, we looked at the the opening of the book of Mark and the beginning of the proclamation of the gospel. Well, we're in setting number two. Setting number two is that Jesus has just healed a man who was paralyzed by saying your sins are forgiven. And that really made the religious people go nuts. They were very upset about that. Who does this guy think he is that he can forgive sin? But then Jesus called Levi, who is Matthew. We know him as Matthew. He wrote the book of Matthew, but he was a tax collector. And so Jesus is hanging out with tax collectors and people that the religious leaders think are enemies of Israel and enemies of God. So then Jesus goes, just to make matters even more offensive, he goes to Matthew or Levi's house and eats a feast. He is hosted by him. He eats his food. He hangs out with his friends. So in the setting that we're talking about right now that we're about to get into, Jesus is still at that feast. He is sitting at the table at Matthew's house, and he is eating a feast. So this is the parable of the bridegroom with the guests. But I want to set that up because in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three of them, the context leading up to the Pharisees, what they're about to ask is, Jesus, why don't your disciples fast? And Jesus is going to give a response to that that I hope is going to really blow your mind with the depth of what Jesus is is saying in like five words, he's actually quoting like a hundred scriptures all at the same time. I'm exaggerating, but only a little bit, I guarantee you. Okay, Jesus is amazing in what he is saying, but What is significant is that the setting leading up to this discourse is exactly the same in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, sometimes you'll see as we go through this course, the setting is a little different from one to the other. But the fact that the setting is exactly the same in all three, I think, is significant. So I wanted to set that up for you. But remember, Jesus is at Levi's house. He's eating a feast. All right, so this is Mark chapter 2, verse 18. Now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Okay, just pause for a second. If you've ever fasted for religious reasons and not because the Holy Spirit's prompted you to, and somebody else is like eating a feast right in your face, you might be a little upset about that. Just, just a little side thought. Okay, so John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Jesus, he's eating a feast at the tax collector's house. And the people came to him and said, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. Okay, so biblical fasting. We touched on this in the last class. The fast that God actually desires is just for you to deny yourself and live for him and pour your life out, not for your own benefit, but for the benefit of others who have less than you. But biblical fasting as it pertains to food, is an act of self-denial, afflicting yourself, abstaining from food. So I hear people talk about like, oh yeah, I gave up TV. I was fasting TV. That's not fasting. That That's not fasting. That's abstaining. Fasting, biblically speaking, is when you don't eat food or when you don't drink water. It is an act of repentance before God for seeking his kingdom, his mercy, his favor, the fulfillment of his purposes, his promises. Fasting is an act of humbling yourself before God. Well, Pharisees, unfortunately, they fasted as a matter of religious obligation. And what the book of Matthew tells us clearly is the Pharisees, they fasted to be seen by men. They fasted as an act of religious superiority. They thought, oh, that like the Pharisee and the tax collector, he said, oh, I'm so glad that I'm not like that tax collector. You know, I fast twice a week. So like I'm in right standing with God, but that guy, he's just an enemy of God. He'll never be forgiven, but I am in right 
right standing with God because, look, I'm so holy. I'm so pious. I fast two days a week. Well, they did it to be seen by men so that other people would also regard them as holy as they were regarding themselves. Okay, it was all for show. And Jesus said for that, they have received their reward in full. There will be no reward from God for that because they've already received their reward by being acknowledged and honored by other people. Well, John the Baptist, his disciples, he fasted and his disciples fasted. They lived a life of self-denial. John was out there in the wilderness eating a strange diet, like wearing weird clothes. John, he was living a fasted lifestyle all the time. And his followers and disciples, they also fasted, meaning completely abstained from food. But they were doing so for the right reasons. They were doing so to wait in anticipation and expectation for the arrival of the king kingdom of God. So they were living their lives, anticipating the fulfillment of the prophecies of Daniel and so many others, that the kingdom of God was going to come in glory and in power. The books would be opened and judgment would be rendered for the holy ones and against the unrighteous and the wicked and all nations that were not calling upon the name of the Lord. So they were eagerly awaiting the Messiah's arrival. And the, and the introduction of the Messianic age. So their whole ministry, John the Baptist and his disciple, all they did was to prepare the way by calling people into repentance from their sin so that they could be purged and cleansed and in a condition that would be acceptable to the Messiah when he arrived. The, and this is also an indication, all of Israel, the Bible-believing people of Israel, the Jewish people, and the, the territory was called Judea at the time, and they were under the oppression of Rome, but all of the people of God, the covenant people of God, they were waiting with anticipation for the Messiah to come. They also, they had read the prophecies of the Messiah and how he was going to come and overthrow all other kingdoms and set them free and set them up as the ruling kingdom in the new heavens and the new earth. And they were eagerly anticipating this. But there's other imagery used about the Messiah coming and the wedding feast. The Messiah would be like the bridegroom, the bridegroom of the Lord, God himself marrying his people, that Israel would be the bride. And so I've put some of these scriptures to give you a picture of this, because what did Jesus say? His response in parable form, he said, can wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? He's saying, I am the bridegroom. So I want to give you some backdrop of what those scriptures are. So Isaiah 25 verses 6 through 9 are about the wedding feast. Now, this would have been well known by all the Jewish people anticipating the wedding feast of God. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food. Did you see that? All peoples, not just the people of Israel, but all peoples. For all peoples, a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, a rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well-refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up the death forever. What is that? He's saying he's the one that's crushing the head of the serpent who has the power of death. The death is the veil that has been covering over all people. If you are descended from Adam, you're going to die. That's the way it goes. You're born in the flesh. You're going to die. So Jesus had to come to usher us back into eternal life through faith in him. But this is what it is. Uh, this is describing the wedding feast and how he's going to swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth and the Lord for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. So this is the wedding feast that everyone is anticipating the new heavens, the new new earth, the new wine. And we're going to get into that in a moment, but that's not this one. That's the next thing that Jesus says. Okay. Jesus is packing so much into this response. We've got to break it down bit by bit. 
But I want you to see, he's saying, I am the bridegroom. I am the bridegroom. You can't fast when it's a time to rejoice because the bridegroom is here. Let's look at some other scriptures about the wedding feast and the bridegroom and the bride. This is Isaiah 54, starting with verse 4. Fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be disgraced. For you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood. You will remember no more. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. The God of the whole earth he is called. For the Lord has called you like a wife deserted and grieved in spirit, like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. For a brief moment I deserted you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In overflowing anger, for a moment I hid my face from you, but with everlasting love I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Hallelujah. So you're getting the picture. The people of Israel living in Judea, oppressed by Rome, they had had a kingdom of their own. And God was their king until they appointed their own king. The first king was Saul, and he didn't work out so well. And then David came. He was a man after God's own heart. And the Messiah was promised to be in the line of David. The seed of David would carry the covenant of David with an eternal kingdom and even be the son of God. But in the kings that followed, what happened after Solomon is that the northern kingdom divided from the southern kingdom. And then the northern kingdom, they had nothing but bad kings. And so they got exiled and sent away into all the nations scattered. Assyria conquered them and scattered them into exile. And then a little while later, maybe 150 years or so later, the same thing happened when Babylon sent the southern kingdom into exile. And the southern kingdom went into exile in Babylon, but then 70 years went by and the people came back to the land. And in the midst of all of that, the prophets had warned the people to repent of their sins, but if they didn't, they'd be sent into exile. Well, they were. But then in the midst of exile, Daniel prophesied that the Redeemer was going to come and was going to come in a time of hardship. Daniel had vision and revelation that when they returned from exile to the land, it was not going to be the fulfillment or restoration of the kingdom as they were hoping, at least not right away. It was going to be in a time of darkness and oppression by other nations. It would be restoration to the land, but not total restoration to the kingdom until the messenger sent from God would come come. So, and I don't want to go too far into that, but I'm trying to give you the backdrop that the people themselves are now returned from exile. They're in the land and they are waiting, waiting for this messenger to come. And I know what the rabbis have done with Daniel, particularly chapter nine, is they have through the centuries, because the rabbis have uh, tried very, very, very hard to disqualify Jesus as the Messiah of Israel. They have really contorted the time frames and the scriptures and whatever to mean something that they don't mean. But if you start to calculate the time frame given by Daniel, everyone in the land at that time would have known it's now. It's now. The Messiah should be here any moment. They were all calculating what the prophecies were saying, and they were anticipating it now. But remember, fear not, you will not be ashamed, you will not be disgraced, you will not be confounded. The, the, the Lord is redeeming people from their own oppression, from being oppressed by other nations. The people of Israel looked foolish, and even they, and they wouldn't give up the, the profession that their God was the most high God, the greatest God, the most powerful God, the God who created heaven and earth. But even so, it's like if you're a foreign nation, let's say you're Babylon and you're like, okay, you say you've got this big, powerful God, but I just conquered you. So what's up with that? Or you're Rome and you're like, yeah, these people, they think they've got this powerful God. They worship their God. They have all these religious observances and stuff, but like we're still the boss, right? So they're God, not the boss. We're the boss because we've got the weapons. We've got the power. They're God, not the boss. We're the boss. So Israel looks foolish. Israel's God even looks foolish in the sight of the nations. But what the Redeemer, what the Lord is promising is you're not going to be ashamed. This is all going to work out for you in the end. No matter how bad it looks, I've got a feast prepared for you and everyone else who will follow me that is like nothing you have ever dreamed of. And I will bring you into the new heavens and the new earth. There will be no death. There will be 
no crying or pain, and the reproach that you have suffered from all the nations of the earth will be taken away because I myself am going to marry you like a bridegroom marries a bride. And even though you have looked foolish for a little while, you will no longer be grieved. It has looked like I divorced you or abandoned you, but I am coming for you. This is the messianic hope. This is the hope of the bridegroom. Jesus is saying, I'm not fasting. My disciples aren't fasting because the bridegroom is here. I'm it. I'm him. But he is saying in five words, he's saying, I am the fulfillment of these scriptures. There are a couple more in your study guide. I just want you to see the depth and the magnitude of what Jesus is talking about. So Isaiah 61, verse 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress and a bride adorns herself with jewels. So this again is the anticipation of the bridegroom and the bride that there will be great rejoicing in the Lord when he comes to fulfill his mission. And Isaiah 62 verse 4, you shall no longer be termed forsaken and your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called my delight is in her. That's also Hepzibah. So uh, an older translation will not just translate it, but will put the name Hepzibah. That is the name there. So we'll be called Hepzibah and your land will be called Beulah for the Lord delights in you and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your, your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. So you see, Jesus is saying, I'm the bridegroom. I'm the bridegroom and I'm here to rejoice over you. I'm here to call you to repentance. I'm here to heal you of your sickness. I'm here to show mercy to you for all of your sin. I'm here to redeem you. I'm here to redeem you from death. I'm here to cast out the shadow of death. He, he, he's saying, I am the bridegroom. I am the one that is here to take away your shame and to marry you and to sing songs of rejoicing over you. And Psalm 45, Psalm 45 is a wedding psalm. It's a psalm that is also quoted in Hebrews chapter 1 that is confirming Jesus as the Messiah and the bridegroom to his people. He's not just like an angel. He's not just like a priest. He's so much better than that. He is God in the flesh. He is the Son of God. He is the bridegroom. This is Psalm 45, starting with verse 6. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And again, so he's saying, therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness. So the psalmist is addressing the bridegroom as God. Therefore, God... Your God has anointed you. Do you see that? And this is part of what the author of Hebrews is highlighting here to say that Jesus, the bridegroom, is God. He is God, and God the Father has anointed him with the oil of gladness. Why? Because he loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Why? Because the scepter of his kingdom is the scepter of uprightness. He is there to fulfill the mercy of God. He is there to bring the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, which is the mercy and the love of God extended to all people, in addition to calling them to repentance. Don't leave that part out. He is calling sinners to repentance to show mercy to them. All right, so I think you get the picture. Jesus is the bridegroom. He is the Messiah. He has arrived. So his disciples were not fasting because it was a joyous event. 
It was a joyous event. Why would you fast and afflict yourself when the joy of the whole world has entered onto the scenes? And so again, just breaking the parable down, the wedding guests are the people who are with Jesus, including the sinners and the tax collectors, the very ones that he has called to repentance, the oppressed, the ones whom he is setting free from all of these things in fulfillment of the scriptures pertaining to the bridegroom. But the feast is prepared to be enjoyed. It's a festive occasion. It's a celebration. It's a great, it's a party. It's a big party. But Jesus did also say that he was going away. And after he went away, then in that day, his disciples will fast. And so I'm just pulling the pieces together of Jesus' response. Let's just read it again so we hear it again with fresh ears. Now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and the people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. All right, so what's the point? The parable point, when Jesus was on earth, it was time to celebrate because the king had arrived. The bridegroom had arrived. It was not a time for mourning or sorrow or self-affliction. It was a time for rejoicing in the loving kindness and the mercy of God. And the fact that, you know, Isaiah 52, when the good news is being proclaimed by those with beautiful feet, the good news is Zion. Your God reigns. You are not disappointed. You have waited for God and he has come for you. You said that your God was the most high God, the only God maker of heaven and earth. You're right. He is. And he's here to fulfill every promise to you. This is great and glorious news. It is not a time for self-affliction when the king of all the earth is there fulfilling his promises to you. It's like if somebody wanted to throw you a birthday party and you said, oh no, I have to, I have to fast. I can't enjoy my own birthday cake because I'm fasting. No, this was a time for rejoicing. And then looking at it through the lens of what is Jesus doing? Jesus, well, he's been demonstrating what real fasting looks like. You know, the Pharisees, they were fasting for their own reasons. John the Baptist, his disciples, they were fasting for legitimate reasons, but Jesus was doing the fast that God desires. Jesus was healing the sick, out there showing mercy to the oppressed, redeeming, calling sinners to repentance, helping the poor, helping the afflicted, binding up the wounded. He was the living, walking, talking, breathing demonstration of Isaiah 58 and Isaiah 42. Jesus was revealing his identity as the bridegroom and the fulfillment of all of these prophetic scriptures. And it's in contrast to the fasting that the Pharisees thought they were doing so self-righteously, right? So let's look at the further considerations. The Pharisees, obviously, we talked about this before, they had lost their perspective. They had lost their connection to the purpose of fasting. The purpose of fasting is to connect with the heart of God. The purpose of fasting is to humble yourself before God, to come more into alignment with him and his purposes. And if you've ever fasted, sometimes you're hungry. And when you're hungry, you can get cranky. So, you know, these cranky Pharisees are there afflicting themselves, fasting, not eating any food. And Jesus is there eating a feast. So they're probably pretty cranky about that. I can understand. I get it. But still, Jesus is saying, you've missed the point. You've lost your perspective on the heart of God. Now, John the Baptist followers, they were fasting for some legitimate reasons. They anticipated a holy war. 
They did. The The scriptures are very clear. There's a holy war that is yet to come. And there were others in the world at that time, the Essenes especially, who were preparing for a holy war by living a very holy life, very strict in their piety and their observances, and especially their ritual washings. But John the Baptist, he and his followers were anticipating a holy war in accordance with the scriptures about the day of the Lord and the day of judgment, the judgment of God upon all all nations. And John the Baptist also knew that that judgment would come upon the people of God themselves. He has said in his ministry that don't think that just because you're descended from Abraham that you've got a free pass here. That's not how this works. If you're descended from Abraham, but you, you haven't, you're not right with God, you don't have your own righteousness with God, then you're toast, man. You're going down. You're a brood of vipers. You're the seed of the snake. So John and his disciples were right in their anticipation of those things that are still yet yet to come. But God also promised in the very same scriptures that when the Messiah came, he would be a husband to Israel, his bride. He would come with love and mercy and compassion and forgiveness. And so that's another element of what Jesus is fulfilling through his ministry at this time. So the purpose of fasting was really to fast and humble yourself before the Lord, waiting in anticipation for the arrival of the king. But the king had arrived. Jesus was here. But still, Jesus also knew that this was not the wedding feast itself. The wedding feast is still yet to come. If you haven't noticed, we are still in the old earth, the old heavens, the old earth. We're not in the new heavens and the new earth yet. Jesus knew that this was not fully the marriage feast. This was more like the engagement feast. What do I mean by that? Well, the Jewish wedding custom in those days was for a groom. The father of the groom would select a bride for him. And then the groom would go to the home of the bride or the family of the bride that was selected for him by his father, and he would become engaged to her. There would be an engagement contract, a binding agreement that was almost exactly like a marriage covenant to the degree that it would even require a certificate of divorce in order to have it nullified. So it was that serious. So at this point, if one was unfaithful to the engagement contract, it was considered Considered the same as adultery. So these two people, the bride and the groom, are bound together with this engagement, just like if they were married. But the marriage cannot yet be consummated until after the wedding feast. So after the engagement, that would be a big party. Now, Jesus was here with his disciples. He's saying, I'm the bridegroom, but he was there for the engagement party. This is the engagement feast. Let's have a great time because we're going to get married. We're entering into this contractual agreement where we're going to be married at some point. But what would happen in the, the Jewish custom is that the groom, after the engagement feast, would then return to his father's land and build a home, or you could say prepare a place to bring his bride, and that's where they would dwell together forever. Once the home was built, he would go back and collect his bride and bring her to the home that he had prepared for her. So this is going to start to sound familiar from John 14, 2 and 3. Jesus is saying, I'm going to prepare a place for you. In my father's house, there are many rooms. If it weren't so, I wouldn't tell you that. I'm going to prepare a place for you, and then I'm coming back to bring you to the place that I've prepared for you, right? So Jesus, even in his response to these Pharisees about the question of fasting, he's saying, I'm the bride. Bridegroom. I'm here to have this engagement feast with people who will repent of their sin and join in marriage covenant with me. That's the new covenant. And then I'm going to go away and they're going to fast in that day because they're going to get ready for me, just like I'm getting ready to come back for them. But uh, then I'm going to come back a second time and I'm going to gather them all up and we're going to have this awesome wedding feast and it will be the fulfillment of all the scriptures that I haven't yet fulfilled in my first coming. So Jesus knew the end from the beginning. And he's saying in these few short simple sentences. He's packing all of this in, which we think it's so unfair. Why didn't he just go on and on and on like I'm going on and on and on? But Jesus, see, he was speaking to religious people, Pharisees, scribes who knew the scriptures. So with just a simple word, they should have had all of these things that I've just unpacked for you. They should have been 
instantly unpacked for them in their minds because of how well they knew the scriptures. They memorized the scriptures. They quoted them. They knew them by heart through their whole lives. They could quote them uh, without even looking at the scroll anymore. So Jesus responding this way should have prompted them to understand what he was saying about himself. He was saying, I am the bridegroom. And again, let's not miss out on the fact that Jesus does make clear. I know there are a lot of believers that they don't fast and they think, oh no, I don't have to fast because Jesus is with me. Well, guess what? Jesus in the flesh is not walking with you right now. You have Christ in you, the hope of glory, but Jesus himself said that he would be taken away. So he's in the heavens right now in bodily form at the right hand of God with all power and authority in heaven and earth and under the earth and this age and the age to come. But Jesus Jesus isn't here right now. He's coming back. But we, as we wait for him, we fast. We fast. Afflict yourself. Humble yourself before the Lord by abstaining from eating food or drinking water as the Lord directs you. So new covenant fasting is going to be similar to John the Baptist and his disciples fasting because we are still anticipating the coming of Messiah the same way that they were anticipating the coming of Messiah and the ultimate day of the Lord when all other kingdoms will be demolished and God will set up his eternal kingdom and the throne of Jesus and he will dwell with us. We will enjoy that great and marvelous wedding feast. There will be no fasting in that day. Our food will be to do the will of the one who sent us. Our food will be the great and rich delicacies of God. We will enjoy the marriage supper of the Lamb when Jesus comes to claim us as his bride, when he returns to give us the new heavens, the new earth, and to share the wedding feast with us. Mm 